welcome to Are We There Yet? The podcast looking at the innovations emerging from the workshops, labs and secret test tracks of Hyundai. Across this series, we've heard about technology which is changing our world. Electric racing cars, hydrogen power and sustainable materials transforming car design. But this edition is taking us to another level. In previous episodes, we've mentioned the concept of flying vehicles, how Hyundai is forging ahead with urban air mobility. I never thought in my lifetime I would see the sort of flying car concept, so that makes me hugely excited. Today, we're having a closer look at this concept, the technology, and how it's already changing the way we think about mobility. I'm Susie Perry, and this podcast comes to you from Hyundai Motor. I'm joined by a person who is a bit of a visionary, getting people to imagine themselves flying through their cities as part of daily life. Pamela Cohen, the Global Chief Operating Officer and US General Manager for the Urban Air Mobility Division of Hyundai Motor Group. Pamela, thanks for joining us today. So great to have you with us. I'm so excited to talk to you. All the podcast series, I've been wanting to talk about this and finally, today's the day. Thank you so much for having me here today, Susie. Um, I am a, a huge geek when it comes to everything, air mobility and flying cars and the Jetsons and bringing it to life. So it's uh, it's great to get to share it with you and all of your listeners. <laughs> Well, fantastic. Yeah, it feels like a a turning point of how we're going to travel. So can you take us into the concept, if you will, into the vision and paint a picture of what urban air mobility, UAM, will look like? So one of the big things for us when we think about urban air mobility is that it should be a seamless part of your day. So in the same way that you wake up every morning and say, okay, I need to go to work or I need to go to school. Let me check if I want to take the metro or if I want to, you know, take an e-mobility solution or if I want to drive, um, you'll just open up an app on your phone and say, you know, I want to get from point A to point B. And all of a sudden it will tell you, here's your best route. And part of that route might be an urban air mobility vehicle. So you'll go outside and a Genesis will come and pick you up at the door and take you off to this beautiful infrastructure where you can pick up your coffee in the morning and your favorite snack as you go and you board this uh, fantastic futuristic flying vehicle. And it'll look a little bit like a small airplane. It'll look a little bit like a flying car. And you'll go and you'll sit inside of this this vehicle as it will whisk you away to your end destination. So you'll sit on this for about 10, 15 minutes, maybe 20 if you're going a pretty long destination. And it will land where you're going on the other side. We'll be greeted again by another coffee shop and a couple of different stores and take your final uh, five minutes or 10 minutes to your destination, whether that's by scooter or by foot. So it's just going to be part of a seamless part of your day where you can be whisked above the clouds over to your end destination, whether it's work or school or the grocery store or meeting up with some friends. It, when you put it like that, it sounds very simple. And at this stage of the podcast, I would normally share an anecdote of my experience of something similar. However, because this is so bleeding edge technology, really, I don't have an experience that I can compare other than the fact that I've been lucky enough in my job to fly in helicopters But as you say, these vehicles are going to look quite different. They're going to look more like a car, perhaps. And flying cars still seem to me like something of a long time away. But this isn't, is it? This is happening now. It's, It's almost gone from pie in the sky to skyrocketing to reality, if you like, if you excuse the terminology. No, absolutely. And I think that's actually one of the really exciting parts because the technology is amazing, right? The ability for us to do an all electric, sustainable, clean, basically quiet helicopter, essentially, or quiet flying car that will take you from from home to work and be part of your everyday journey. It seems so far off. And, And the technology that actually supports that is something that's incredible. And it's taken many, many decades in order to get there in terms of batteries, in terms of propulsion systems, in terms of the way that we create our aero structures. So there's all this great thinking and all this great technology behind it that makes it feel very futuristic. But honestly, it it might feel a little dull when you go and do it because it's just going to be a part of your everyday journey. It's going to be quiet. It's going to be seamless. It's going to feel very natural and very comfortable, um, which is both exciting, but also a little bit strange when you think about what you thought a flying car was actually going to feel like when you were dreaming this up, you know, when we were children and watching the Jetsons. So what might the result be on our lives then? Take us through step by step. So for us, what we're really thinking about is we solve backward from from what society needs and what our citizens need. Congestion is already incredibly challenging in most cities around the world, and it's only going to be getting worse over the next decades. 
you know, congestion is obviously frustrating, but it's also having a very meaningful impact on people's lives. And by being able to actually reduce congestion by creating seamless intermodal experiences where we actually are able to connect more people, we can reduce that congestion and give people back their time. We can also actually connect people, though, with opportunity that they otherwise wouldn't be able to access without these kinds of accelerated forms of transportation. So when we think about the problem that we're trying to solve, we think about cities that are heavily congested. How do we make sure that we connect people with opportunity? Opportunity that otherwise couldn't have been connected and reduce the amount of time and frustration you, you give to basically non-productive time sitting behind the wheel of your car that you otherwise could have actually with your family or doing something productive on a UAM vehicle. So for us, that's what we're really trying to address. And, and in our view, it's not just the air domain that solves that. It's actually an integrated intermodal experience where you don't really think about what you need to do to get from point A to point B. We take care of that for you. And part of it may be in the air. But for you, it's actually a pleasant part of your day and it's a seamless part of your day as opposed to something that you have to dread every morning when you wake up and think about your commute into work. Yeah, so this project is effectively very passenger centric. At the heart of everything that we do is our passengers and it's the citizens that we serve around the world and it's our, our customers and what they need and it's something that's very unique to Hyundai in many ways. Hyundai has always tried to put the passengers at the center of everything that they do and it's no different in the air domain. Um, We've heard across the series all kinds of ways in which Hyundai are leading the way in terms of being sustainable, helping to clean up the oceans, developing hydrogen power, using high-tech recycled materials in car interiors. How does that goal of sustainability form a part of this project, Pamela? When we think about our vehicles, there's a couple of really fundamental principles. You know, they need to be inclusive. They need to be affordable. They need to be intermodal and integrated. And above all else, they need to be clean. Sustainability is one of the the key cornerstones of what we're doing right now at the UAM division. So when you look at our aircraft that we're going to be developing, they are going to be zero emissions aircraft, Um, whether they are going to be battery powered, which is what we anticipate our first vehicles looking with our electric vertical takeoff and landing designs, or whether in the future they may be hydrogen powered. Um, They are going to have sustainability at the heart of everything we do. And it's something that we think about as a critical part of our design. And Hyundai It's obviously known as an automotive manufacturer, um, not an aerospace company. So why is Hyundai taking to the skies? We are so well known for our cars, um, which is fantastic. And, you know, we're very proud of our legacy there. But honestly, that the future of mobility it's more in the services side. It's more about trying to solve the problem for people as opposed to making discrete products. And as Hyundai has thought about how we want to approach that that future and our products and services we want to offer, um, a lot of it comes down to really thinking about what our clients need, thinking about what our customers need, and building an integrated service offering. And that includes a lot of really cool stuff on the ground. You've, You've seen a lot of the work we're doing with electrification and with robotics, but it also means leveraging the air domain, which is open right now and offers incredible opportunity for our people and our customers to be able to access where they need to go much more quickly. And and the other part is that automotive players have a very important role to play in terms of the aerospace industry. Aerospace historically have really struggled to hit affordability targets and to hit certain volumes of aircraft. And if we're going to actually make UAM happen and make it affordable so everyone can access this and do this in the volume that we're anticipating, Automotive is actually the natural player who can do that, who can bring that scale, who can bring that affordability and do that while maintaining a certain level of safety and quality and reliability that everyone needs to feel happy and safe getting on our vehicles. So the mass production is is one, obviously one area that Hyundai bring to the table here. Absolutely. And it's one of our, our big kind of competitive advantages that we think really helps set us apart inside of that market. Being able to do that mass production, which aerospace has traditionally struggled with, and doing that at an affordability point while maintaining safety and quality, that's really the key to making sure that this is an accessible form of transportation going forward. I want to ask you, before we go any further, um, about where we are in terms of timings. How far away is this? Will we see it roll out quite slowly? You know, how, how will that work? So our entry into service date is 2028. And so you'll start seeing our vehicles actually hitting the skies in about seven years or so. And the way that we view the market actually maturing is at the beginning, there will be limited services. We'll start doing certain routes inside of certain cities to kind of demonstrate the technology and get people comfortable with it. So you should be able to access it by the end of this decade. But we see this growing and maturing throughout the 2030s and becoming more and more ubiquitous over time as we build the infrastructure, we continue to make those strong partnerships, and we continue to make this more and more affordable as we go forward. Mid to late 2030s to the 2040s, this should be a daily part of your commute. (laughs) 
Okay, I want to know a little bit about you, Pamela. Can you tell me where this interest came from? A little bit about your background, if you if you will. For me, I've always been driven by a passion for innovative technology and how we can use that to actually, you know, address really sticky problems, whether they're economic or they're social or they're access oriented. And so I've always been drawn to really highly regulated technologies and trying to figure out, you know, how do we actually go to the nexus of public interest and uh, innovation and find the best path forward that actually helps society and helps us leverage this technology in a safe way. So that naturally uh, brought me into the aerospace arena (laughs) for a very long time. So I started my career actually as a consultant, as a leader in McKinsey & Company's aerospace and defense practice, and as the founder and director of their Unmanned Aerial Systems Hub. Um, So I was always trying to find ways to say, okay, how do we bring new technology in here? How do we think about how this technology can revolutionize how we connect or how we serve our clients or how we serve the government? And eventually decided that I wanted to move beyond just business side and and get more into the policy and get more into the technical. So I started my own uh, boutique firm that focused on the future of mobility technology called Ascension Global served folks like NASA and aerospace OEMs and automotive OEMs and help them think through how do we bring together a truly actionable business plan to actually bring a new technology to market and have it solve a really sticky customer problem. And uh, one of my clients there was actually Hyundai Motor Group. And so I was working with Hyundai at the very beginning of figuring out what they wanted to do in UAM. What would that business look like? Does it make sense for them? And eventually they said, you know, instead of being one of our consultants, why don't you bring your whole team inside and actually build this company with us and, and make this real and bring it to market? And so back in January 2020, uh, that's what I did. I brought the whole team over from Ascension, and uh, we've been building and growing ever since and trying to make this dream a reality uh, and bring the Jetsons to life for everyone around the world. I'm assuming that you've worked a lot with drone technology with what you've just said. How much would you say that has been able to speed up urban air mobility and the chance of that? Oh, definitely. Yeah, there's a lot of really great um, technical progress that's been made on things like um, key sensors, the way we think about air traffic management, batteries and propulsion. There's also a lot of great stuff that we're actually learning from public acceptance, though. And how do we best engage with the public to make them comfortable with this technology? Um, and there have been some some great positives and some great negatives from the experience with drones. And so a lot of it has been a really formative experience for us, both technically, but also in terms of regulation and in terms of public acceptance. In this series, we've heard a lot about Hyundai's engagement with infrastructure, whether that's helping build an infrastructure for hydrogen power or electrification, which you touched on earlier, the wider infrastructure there. Here again, this isn't just about flying cars, is it? It, It's about the entire infrastructure of getting from A to B. And you've talked about the congestion and the reason why we need to look to the skies for a solution here. But can we talk a bit about Los Angeles? That is one of the places where this concept will come to life. How will it work over there? And will it solve any other problems or is it just purely about congestion? One of the things I think is really important to know is that, you know, urban air mobility, it's just a fancy flying science project if you don't have infrastructure. Because if there aren't safe places for it to take off and land, if it doesn't have networks that allow it to actually provide access to areas where people actually need to go, and if it doesn't connect with other forms of transportation, it's not going to be very useful. It's not really going to be able to take off, so to speak, and be able to provide that impact that we want inside of society. So infrastructure is a huge part of of what we're doing. And and like you said, LA is a really great example of one of those areas where we are working really closely, actually, with the city of LA right now to think through what what is that infrastructure pattern that we're going to need in order to do this? How do we actually make an intermodal system where UAM seamlessly integrates with other forms of transportation through the infrastructure and through the way that customers actually access an app or access the actual services themselves to make this actually workable. So in LA, it's one of the the cities that you can see. They're very forward-leaning on this right now. They're really starting to think into the future. And infrastructure is such a critical component of, of what we're doing there and what we're talking to them about because it is such an important enabling part of this industry. LA is a sort of sprawling metropolis. You generally need a vehicle to get around Los Angeles, don't you? There's not sort of a a heart to LA. It's, It's all over the place. It's quite a large area and it's quite low level as well. Does that bear any impact on on this? And or or is it a mind thing? Is it that they are forward thinking and they want to jump in and they want to be kind of, you know, one of the first places to implement this? Definitely the fact that they have so much congestion, they are so sprawled out, and they have had historically so many issues with connectivity between different parts of the city. 
all of those are critical components in terms of figuring out whether or not this is going to be an important system, which we believe it is going to be a very important system for them as a result of it. And those kinds of characteristics that you laid out there, they're critical in determining what other cities around the world will also need to leverage this technology. So when you think about Europe, for example, when you think about places like Berlin, with how much urban sprawl there is there and how it takes about an hour just to get across the city, that's another very similar place to LA where we say, okay, this could actually be a really fantastic technology that can hook into that infrastructure and serve a meaningful need. Same with when you think about Paris, for example. I mean, they're they're number four, I believe, on the global traffic scoreboard uh, from 2019, and and Parisians lose about 165 hours a year to traffic congestion alone. Those kinds of things, those kinds of pain points, those kinds of issues with both the infrastructure and connectivity today, they're so fundamental in determining how big of a role UAM is going to play. And so in places like LA, where they have those characteristics, in places like Berlin, in places like Paris, this is where you're finding a really good combination of a really true and genuine need to try to find other forms of mobility to try to increase access and decrease congestion, as well as in many of those places like LA, really forward-leaning governments that are excited to think about innovation and work with industry to find solutions to it. Right, because I'm imagining that governments, legislation, these kinds of things must be such a huge challenge for you putting this together. I mean, the way you talk about it is so positive, of course, but it's it's one heck of a big project, isn't it? I mean, you're talking globally and you're talking about changing our lives completely, really, seamlessly, but completely. No, absolutely. And I mean, pol- like our engagement with policymakers and regulators, both at the state and local as well as the federal levels, um, it's critical to our path forward. And and obviously part of it is is us trying to work with them to educate them on what is our technology? Um, what is the promise that we actually hold for their communities and their constituencies? And, and why do we think that this is a really positive thing? But a lot of it is also us listening and hearing a little bit more and educating ourselves on what are their true pain points? What are their concerns when it comes to things like zoning or when it comes to things like noise? And how do we take that into account as we design our products and we design all of our, our different services to make sure that we're really serving those communities in a really meaningful way. And, you know, one of the really big things that we think about here, and this goes back to an earlier part of your question, is, you know, obviously congestion is a big part of what we're trying to solve. Um, But there's also other components to it, too, like ensuring that this is an accessible technology that everyone is able to actually use and everyone is actually able to leverage. And that's actually very unique for many transportation methods where many people, especially people with disabilities, were left behind historically. So so that's another really big thing that we work with our with our policymakers on as well to make sure we're thinking about that. Another really big one in terms of access is actually in terms of equity and thinking beyond simple business cases and what are the access points and where are people kind of stranded on the edge of opportunity, so to speak, today in terms of transportation and how do we leverage UAM and how do we leverage other technologies and other mobility services as part of Hyundai to solve those equity goals and to solve those access goals, whether it's through where we place our infrastructure networks or or where we offer our services. So it, it definitely is a really big and robust conversation. And part of it is us obviously advocating to to try to get and pave that pathway for us in terms of regulation. But a lot of it is them educating us on what actually are they trying to solve and how do we best serve those communities. Right, because obviously cost is going to play such a massive part of this. And in order to make it open to everybody, the cost point, the price point has to be low, doesn't it? It has to be very affordable for the normal person. Otherwise, we're just talking about now you can go and take a helicopter if you've got loads of money and you want to fly. You know, I mean, that that's sort of where we are, isn't it? So to get to that point so soon almost seems not impossible, but difficult, you know, to reach that point of affordability, doesn't it? must be a huge challenge that. Oh, it is definitely one of the biggest challenges industry faces today. And it's one of the reasons why I think automakers play such an important role here, because the automotive industry is great at taking out costs and leveraging their supply chain and advanced manufacturing technologies in order to drive that affordability and make sure that this is actually accessible to everyone. In our opinion, we don't think that UAM will have done its job and will have had the impact it's going to have unless it is affordable, unless it is something that everyone every day can consider as part of an option set that they can take in order to get to work or to take in order to get to school. So it's one of the things that we spend actually most of our time on right now is making sure that from everything, 
everything from the design of the vehicle. We're thinking about cost and designing for manufacturability to ensure that we can keep everything as affordable as possible to our supply chain. As we work with our supply chain partners, thinking through how do we actually co-invest with the partners we bring on board to drive down those costs over time to our technology development roadmaps, ensuring that not only are we going to hit peak performance to not only ensure safety and reliability, but top performance, but also drive down affordability along those cost curves to make sure that even the most cutting edge technologies, we have a plan in place to make sure that they're actually going to be affordable and we're able to offer these services to everyone. So affordability to us is one of the cornerstones of everything we do from vehicle design all the way down to nitty gritty negotiations in the supply chain. In your opinion, is the globe listening to this? Is this a global solution? Oh, absolutely. I, uh, you know, UAM is going to look different in different markets around the world, just depending on how much congestion you have, um, what kinds of alternative technologies are there. But for us, we see this as something that's helpful for almost every city around the world. Um, from relieving congestion in Tokyo to making your LA commute so much simpler to addressing urban sprawl inside of Berlin or in Paris, all of these cities around the world, we see a common need for being able to bust congestion and increase connectivity. And we think that UAM is going to be a very critical part of that going forward. Okay. Can we take a closer look at what you call PAV, a passenger air vehicle now? Uh, how much can you tell us about what it might look like? As you guys saw about two years ago at CES, at the last in-person CES, we unveiled our first thought of what that concept could look like, which was the SA-1. It gives you a taste of what these things are going to actually look like going forward. They're going to be pretty sleek. They're going to be very quiet in the way that we actually design them. They should be very welcoming. Uh, one of the big challenges we have today with when you look at helicopters, other than the fact that they are incredibly noisy and that they do have a lot of pollution associated with them because they're not electric, um, is that they're not very welcoming. When you look at the design of them, they're actually a little bit scary. They can often look a little bit military. And uh, when you think about what the future of these are going to look like, it's going to look a lot more like things that you see today. They're going to have lines that remind you of cars. And it's just going to be a lot more welcoming experience that you would see with current airplanes and specifically currently with helicopters. And we're, we're talking about that sort of amount of people, sort of four or five people in one um, vehicle. And presumably there'll be a pilot to start with. Is that going to move on to being autonomous or what's the what's the idea? In the end, we do want to make these autonomous because we believe it actually increases safety by being able to ensure that the, we have um, autonomous flight. However, we are not going to take the pilot out of the, the driver's seat until both the regulators are comfortable and the public is comfortable. Tell me, um, integrated transport has been the dream, obviously, for, for many years now. And we don't seem to have ever really cracked it. And politicians in loads of countries have talked about it and then left the office without anything really happening. How is this going to be different? Why is it different? This is definitely one of the trickiest issues when it comes to urban air mobility, because in our view, unless this is truly integrated and intermodal, you're not really going to unlock the promise of this technology. It's not going to be easy to integrate into every part of your day. And so for us, this is one of the biggest priorities that we have as we think through our partnerships. And as we look at the landscape, one of the things that we're noticing and one of the things that we're, we're trying to push forward as well to address this historical issue is that public-private partnerships are going to be key in making this happen. And that's something that many people have, have tried before or have talked about before, but there's an increasing recognition, both in terms of industry and in terms of many um, public sector entities, that we really need to actually do this. And we need to collaborate, we need to partner, we need to co-invest, both in terms of financial, in terms of funding and financing, but also in terms of operation and in terms of actually being able to integrate these different technologies and different modes together. So to us, the, the key is really PPPs. Um, and one of the things that we find that's really encouraging is we see industry also recognizing that. And we see public sector entities also recognizing that and making meaningful steps to form these partnerships. So although it still is tricky, I can't say that we've solved it all or that we're 100% sure we have the answer to, to crack the code there. We do think it's really encouraging that there is that recognition and there is more innovation coming in that space to, to try to make this truly happen and to integrate these different forms of transportation and infrastructure. So who are you currently working with? Who are the partners and what role are they playing? One of the things that you'll you hear us say all the time at, at the Urban Air Mobility Division is that it takes a village. This market is huge and there's so much that needs to happen from so many different stakeholders that we are constantly partnering with many different people, big and small, legacy and brand new startups um, from technology to infrastructure to make this happen. 
Um, some of the big ones though that I'd highlight here is um, one of the ones that we just recently announced was the city of LA. And so the city of LA is a really strong partner of us. We partnered with them through the Urban Movement Labs to create a first in its nation fellowship to be looking at urban air mobility and how do we think about planning for that at a city level? And how do we think about setting up the criteria and working through all the kinks in terms of policy and regulation and planning and partnerships and funding? And so um, that's one of the really big partners we have right now. And we see that as kind of making a roadmap of how do we actually work with cities and how do we work with these localities to truly understand their needs and help them plan for and tailor the solutions to what they need. Another really exciting one actually on your side of the pond is our, our partnership with urban airports. So as part of the future flight challenge in the UK, we're actually going to be out in Coventry a little bit later this year, exploring intermodal forms of infrastructure. We're going to have actually a, a demonstration there of some of the infrastructure of Vertiport that urban airports is creating, as well as one of our, uh, our mock-ups of some of our models to actually show and, and explore what is the look and feel of this technology and this infrastructure and have the public come and see this and touch it and feel it and see that it's real and give us feedback on how we can actually make this smoother. Um, so those are two that I would highlight. Did you say Coventry? I did, yes. <laughs> I thought you did. And then I was thinking, why Coventry? Yeah, well, the city of Coventry is actually um, a really great partner right now um, through this Future Flight Challenge. And uh, they're excited about the technology. And they're one of the areas where connectivity to other cities around them and other localities around them could be really critical, both in terms of being able to actually access opportunities there and also bringing more economic development to the area. Um, so Coventry is one of the really great examples of actually a, a smaller city that could actually benefit from urban air mobility. Because I, I think a lot of us, when we think about urban air mobility, we immediately think of New York City and we think of LA and we think of Tokyo. Um, but actually, it's something that can really help more regional areas be connected to some of the opportunities and some of the, the access that they would want for some of those larger areas. And how important do you think it is to have these projects and these successful um, partnerships to convince the public that this is a great thing to do? Because it seems to me as though some of the public will be really excited about it and some will be utterly terrified by the thought of it. Honestly, I think it's one of the most important things that we can do. You know, as a bunch of like tech nerds, um, we love this technology. We can't wait for this to come to market. We think this is the coolest thing ever. You've heard me say the Jetsons, I think 50 times already in the podcast. You know, we love this. We can't <laughs> wait for this to come to the market. But as you said, a lot of other people have never even heard of or thought of this technology. And it can be really scary, especially when you think about the, the level of technology and the level of trust you need to have inside of these vehicles and inside of this infrastructure. So one of the biggest things we actually need to do is, is work on public acceptance and really engage and get feedback from the public and specifically the communities we're hoping to serve in order to make sure that we're, we're taking that into account and we're hearing them and we're integrating changes in our design or in our services uh, to make sure that it really fits what they want, but also that they feel comfortable actually getting onto our vehicles and having these vehicles fly over their homes and their schools and their communities. Um, so it's one of the most important things I think that we can do. And it's one of the reasons I'm so excited for the Coventry event is to just get real people out there and seeing this and touching our vehicle and, and working on the infrastructure and, and telling us, you know, what are the crazy things we're doing that we need to change and what are they excited about and what are they scared about? Um, so we can we can use that and actually make something really meaningful for them. And in terms of public acceptance, do you think the biggest challenge is the safety? Yeah, I think it's both the safety, but also demonstrating that safety. Because it's one thing for us to be able to say, listen, we've tested this so many times, we've met all of the regulatory requirements, and we feel that it's safe. And it's another thing for an everyday person who isn't used to aviation being part of their everyday life to say, I feel safe stepping on this, and I feel safe having my children go and use this technology. Yeah, and I suppose within that as well, the regulations of how it's managed in the air, we all know about air traffic control and having to wait to land at Heathrow Airport and places like that. So, you know, all that is is, is going to be very complicated as well, isn't it? Absolutely. That is, uh, air traffic management is one of the most challenging technical aspects off the vehicle that we work on today. And it's part of our digital infrastructure. Um, because as, as we were talking about earlier, we are definitely going to have uh, autonomy as part of this in the future. And our air traffic management system today is very manual. 
Um, and so when we think about what that air traffic management system needs to be in the future, not only do we need to deconflict the air traffic so that, you know, UAM vehicles don't interact with manned helicopters and don't interact with manned airplanes um, through the way that we divide up the airspace and we manage flows of traffic. But we also need to think about in the future with the amount of volume of traffic we're going to have and hopefully autonomy at some point, how do we create a system, both digital and physical, that allows us to do that safely and reliably? So there's a lot of work going on with that. There's a lot of really great collaboration actually between industry and regulators on designing that system and figuring out how we make sure it's reliable and that it's very redundant and very safe um, so that we can actually facilitate this type of air travel. And with the time span that you're talking about, with us seeing this by the end of the decade and getting used to it over the next decade and then being very affordable the following decade, um, how challenging is the is the ecosystem development as well? Because obviously everything is changing so much now. It's actually funny. So one of the things I always tell our organization is, you know, we actually have a dual mission as an organization. One is to create an incredibly safe, high-performing, reliable, affordable vehicle itself. But the second mission, which is actually equally as important, is to develop the ecosystem and open the market for this technology to actually happen. And that ecosystem development part, I think it's very hard because, as you said, on the vehicle side, we kind of control the variables there. We can control the speed at which we progress through different technology curves. We can actually go and drive that internally pretty easily with, obviously, engagement with regulators. But on the ecosystem, there are so many moving pieces and so many different stakeholders that aviation isn't used to interacting with, especially when we think about how we connect this to other modes of mobility. So developing that ecosystem while well, it moves around us and making sure we have strong partnerships with everyone across the ecosystem, that's a really critical part to make sure that we actually have infrastructure in place and public acceptance waiting to take this and integration with other mobility modes when we come to market. So I, I fully agree that ecosystem development part it's not only an equal mission of our dual mission inside of the organization, but to me, it's actually one of the more challenging parts of making sure we keep up with this and we evolve with the ecosystem as it moves forward. It's so exciting talking about this and the fact that it is going to be a, re a reality so soon. And when you look back at the automotive industry, how they've changed from just making cars to effectively making spaces that you can work in, live in, get from A to B. It's not just about driving a car anymore. Your car is so much more than a car. And now here we go a step forward where we're going to be climbing into a car, taking off vertically and going across our city in minutes rather than hours. It still seems to me to be mind blowing, it, even having heard everything you said today, but exciting actually as well. And I can see the smile on your face, which obviously anybody listening can't, but they can probably hear it through the way that you speak. Your passion is very strong for this. But the fact that it's actually going to happen is um, is incredible. And honestly, it's something that I have to kind of like pinch myself on some days uh, when I wake up in the morning. You know, I, I wake up and I, I go, well, I used to go to the office, but now I move into the other room in my home, which is the office. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I have to remember like, oh, I get to make this happen. I get to make the Jetsons real today. Um, and it's uh, it's incredibly exciting. You know, I, I say sometimes it's going to feel dull once you get used to it, which I, I think is true. But, you know, it is, it's very inspiring. And uh, one of the things that, that I think it's really fun actually working at, at Hyundai UAM right now is that that inspiration and that, that innovation and that spirit of we're actually going to make this happen, um, it's in all of our people here. And so every day when we have meetings and even when we face challenges, whether they're on the technical side or they're on the business side, there's this spirit that runs through all of the people here of like, this is truly revolutionary and we're actually going to bring this to life. Um, and it keeps us going and it drives us because it truly is exciting. It's it's almost mind blowing, like you say, when you when you actually think about what we're able to deliver to society and, and so soon. Um, so so I agree. I mean, I, I'm super excited about it. I'm very passionate about it. And I think any person that you meet inside of our division here, you'll you'll find that same passion and that same kind of love that drives them forward of, you know, we're going to make this real. <laughs> we're actually going to make this real. This podcast is called Are We There Yet? And in the context of urban air mobility, obviously, it's fair to say that we are a little way off, um, even though you're obviously trying to put everything in place. But what are some of the, the milestones that we should be on the lookout for, would you say? 
yeah, there's lots of really exciting milestones. I think off the vehicle, you're going to see a lot of great milestones in terms of partnerships coming out. There are going to be more and more opportunities for you to come and actually see the vehicle and touch it and experience it. Use virtual reality and augmented reality to experience what a flight is going to be like before you actually go on one of our vehicles and uh, and see those partnerships coming into place. On the, on the vehicle side, you should be on the lookout for us having prototypes um, in the near future that you'll actually be able to see our technology where we will demonstrate what we can actually do with this technology as we start to go through the certification process. The other key milestones are also going through certification and getting the regulatory bodies to okay this and feel comfortable with the safety and reliability. And then, of course, our most important milestone is 2028, where we enter the market and allow you to actually take first flight uh, in one of our UAM vehicles and take to the sky for real. But before then, we can put on some headphones, we can put and have a look uh, virtually at what we would experience. Absolutely. Uh, That's one of the things that we think is actually really important, both in terms of just allowing the world to see what's on the horizon, which I think is very exciting, but also for us to get feedback uh, and hear from the public about what they do and do not like about our vehicle and about the experience so we can make sure that we integrate that into the design. Um, So there should be lots more opportunities over the coming years for you to interact through those goggles, um, get to experience this for yourself, but also give us some very valuable feedback so we can use that to integrate into our designs. And tell us when that event in Coventry is going to be. Is there a date yet? It should be towards the beginning of December of this year. Um, So the final dates, I think, are going to be nailed down in the next few weeks. So you'll see an announcement coming out. Okay. Centre of Geeks in the UK that weekend, then. That sounds really exciting. (laughs) Uh, Pamela Curry, thank you so much for joining us and educating us on this podcast. It's been really fascinating and great to talk to you. Uh, Thank you. Have a great day. I'm, I'm excited to see these milestones happen. Thank you so much for having me here. It was great chatting with you and getting to share a little bit of the excitement going on behind the scenes here at at the UAM division. If you're excited about the concept of urban air mobility, you can find out more at Hyundai.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the Are We There Yet podcast from your usual podcast provider. It means, of course, that you'll never miss an episode. Thank you so much for listening. Goodbye.